Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm Martin Mignot. I'm one of the partners at Index Ventures. Uh, Index is an early stage tech investment firm investing across uh, Israel, Europe, and the US as one team globally, based between London, New York, where I am based, and San Francisco. And we've been investing in early stage tech for the past uh, three decades. And we've been fortunate enough to work closely with Nick from, uh, from Revolut for almost a decade uh, as well. So Nick, I'm really super excited to be here with you today. There's, uh, there's tons to talk about, uh, a lot of news at Revolut. I still remember the first time I met you, which was uh, in 2015. You were pitching at Sitcamp, and at the time, it was in Shoreditch, I still remember, in London. And at the time, I was banking with HSBC. And things were so bad that every time I had to make a transfer, I was booking a slot of 20 minutes in my calendar. And that was really terrible. So I, try, I downloaded the app, tried it, and realized I could do it in 20 seconds instead of 20 minutes, and for free. And that's where I realized this is really something special and we need to be investing in this company. Since then, eight, eight or nine years later, the company has grown. This simple app that was doing mostly FX has grown a lot across all dimensions, new products, new geos, and financially. So, Yesterday, you announced your 50 million customer mark. Congrats on that amazing achievement. Uh, last year, you announced more than $2 billion in, in revenue, more than oh. half a billion pounds, and, oh. and more than two, um, more than half a billion in, uh, in net income. You are the fastest growing, the most downloaded financial app in Europe across 20 countries. And, uh, and very recently, you also uh, concluded a, a secondary at a $45 billion valuation, which makes you the uh, most valuable private tech company in Europe. So congrats on all of that. When you're hearing all those milestones, do you take time to celebrate them, or are you already uh, focused on the next one? And what is the next one? Well, I mean, obviously, if you achieve something great, uh, yeah, you need to celebrate. But for me, it's like five minutes happiness, and then, you know, I move on to to new big thing. <laughs> and you have a big party actually coming for your for your uh, 50 million. Yeah, we have right? 50 million parties in London. Yes. And um, so, if you look at Revolut today, you know, 45 billion, you've reached this incredible uh, scale and and success. Does it look like what you had in mind when you got started with the business? Is it pretty much where you thought you would be there, or is it very different? Well, to be honest, with you, when I started, I didn't really think ahead what it will be in five, ten years. I, I was just trying to survive as a business. <laughs> well, that's it. And uh, yeah, it's uh, pretty simple. We back then when we started, we just had uh, three months view what we need to build in three months, and then we build it, and then we move on for the next three months. So we never had like you know long term horizon, long term planning. So we were just trying to survive, try to build uh, features, uh, products that people want. And it was actually very, very short-term driven rather than long-term. And is it still the same or has it changed as you've grown uh, bigger? Uh, as we've grown bigger, we, we started planning uh, for a long uh, time frame. But we still are, like, plan precisely for probably a quarter, <clears throat> quarter to a year. And then longer-term plans, I mean, in reality, uh, uh, we try to do it, but uh, it, it never works. You know, something <laughs> pops up. <laughs> <laughs> Although you need to redirect all resources, yeah. So if you were to paint a picture of where, Rev where you see Revolut kind of long term, uh, the direction it, it's going, can you, can you do that or not even? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, if, if you think in numbers, we, we just want uh, Revolut to be uh, number one uh, global bank in 100 countries with 100 million daily active customers and then 100 billion uh, revenues uh, a year. So it's definitely doable because market is so huge and banks are uh, very fragmented, I would say, so they're not really competing globally. And, and you personally, what is, you know, you've achieved a lot, um, what is still your personal ambition? Well, I mean, there is not much else to do, right? So, 
sort of I, I keep doing it. <laughs> Do you, uh, can you just maybe describe for the people here, what does a typical day for you look like? Well, it, it depends on the day of the week. Or, uh, so, or, I mean, usually on Mondays I do or, um, business reviews for key departments. Or, uh, half of Tuesday is also business reviews. And well, half of, what, what is business review? Can you so business review is like standardized approach for every single department when uh, general managers report on uh, KPIs, metrics, uh, roadmap, uh, problem. So it's 15 to 30 minutes uh, for each department. Then half Tuesday is uh, uh, product reviews. All the Wednesdays product reviews, and I start also one on ones on Thursday. And, and product Friday. reviews, what, how does that so work? So product review is uh, uh, every single product team or majority of product teams they present uh, how they want to change uh, their product lines screen by screen in uh, Figma. And you still. You yeah, I still very involved. Yes, yeah. I approve. Yeah. <laughs> you still approve everything, and yeah, so I still comment. I still work with the designers. I still go down to kind of you know each individual contributor if I want to change something. So you never got out of the founder mode for you. That was always no. I think it's mode. super important. Uh, I think as soon as you start traditionally manage, uh, I think uh, is the beginning of the end for the company because reality uh, is super important for every single manager to. Uh, uh, well, to be strategic, but also to be in detail, and then going down to the level of uh, individual contributor uh, through all the management layers uh, to see what, what reality is, right? Because problem is uh, with majority of managers, they are not into details. As a result, they cannot direct well. And so you, you've got about 40 direct reports? Like a bit more, yeah, like 40, 45, yeah. 40, 45? Yeah. Who, who are there, Berlin? Well, every single general manager responsible for PNL or for um, uh, products. So, because we have many products uh, in the company, so we have uh, probably up to 15 uh, general managers. Then uh, uh, a person responsible. Uh, and what is a product? Give us like the like product. For example, it's a retail account, business account, uh, wealth and trading, uh, crypto, acquiring, uh, credit. Okay. So major major products. Yeah. Uh, so then uh, I've got uh, core functions uh, reporting into me, uh, like people, uh, uh, technology, uh, core, uh, my kind of you know, own team, we call it core, uh, and so on. So overall, if you look, it's 40, 45 people. Oh, plus, uh, new territory CEOs also report directly to me because uh, I think it's very good when you hire a CEO for the territory to, to report directly to fund because they they learn much faster. What's your core team? We say I have my own core team. What, what is that? Uh, it started with uh, Fund Associates. I think I'm the first one in the market who invented the concept of Fund Associates uh, because uh, I was... Uh, kind of chief of staff, no? Or, uh, what's the difference? Well, basically, when, the, when, when, when the company scaled uh, of more than 100 people, uh, and then I hired all these uh, experienced executives, I realized it doesn't work. All this experienced executive failed <laughs> miserably. So I need to fix things. So I end up uh, hiring my own team of uh, eight people, like just smart, uh, bright, uh, young people, ex-McKinsey, ex-Bain, or ex-investment banking, have, you know, hunger and desire you know, to build things. But then I just uh, dropped one or two people for each of the problem, on, on each of the problems uh, I face, or so on each of the departments that need to uh, turn around. So that's how I kind of invented the concept of founder associates. Um, now it's probably a 30, 40 people team. Uh, some of them report to me, some of them report to chief of staff. But uh, the job they do is still the same as a turnaround. That makes sense. On t so on top of your day job, you also recently launched uh, your own family office slash venture fund called Quantum Light. Yeah. So what's the philosophy behind it? How does it work? I mean, it's a very disruptive approach to venture capital in particular. I don't know about the other asset class, but it's for venture. And also, what's the goal behind it? Is, it? is it financial return? Is it giving back to the ecosystem? Is it keeping your pulse on innovation? Uh, so basically, yes, I have family office, and then I have a standalone uh, business uh, called Quantum Light. So Quantum Light is a venture fund which invests in uh, startups, uh, but it invests based on their uh, models rather than human judgment. So the way it works, uh, about three years ago, I. Uh, uh, I built a very small team uh, which uh, collected a lot of data on startups and then they trained the uh, uh, machine learning model on uh, data since 1990s. 
and then the data can be uh, who is the founder or right? who invested in the company uh, is the founder like you know stem non stem or age and so on so we collected about 300 features uh, across uh, uh, every single startup we trained the model uh, on the data since 1990s and then effectively the model predicts uh, which startups to invest so it's completely outbound uh, investment. You do not really need to kind of dive deep in the company. Uh, it just gives you a list of companies to invest. Uh, and uh, yeah, it works well. So I, I launched it uh, two years ago. Um, uh, we've done, uh, I think, more than 12 investments now. Team is uh, 20, 25 uh, people. Majority are data scientists, data engineers. So it's a standalone business. Uh, I'm not involved daily. So there is uh, uh, Ilya, who is a uh, CEO. Uh, of this business, uh, but I help how I can. And there's, uh, well, I mean, I think it's a really super interesting disruptive approach, especially for kind of a Series B when you have enough data to kind of identify interesting companies. But the other thing that's really cool that you do with Quantum Line is you've started publishing these playbooks, which is basically kind of open sourcing what you learn from Revolut and, and yeah. how you build the company. And I've been, you know, I wrote a LinkedIn post about it if, if you folks want to check it out. Uh, your first playbook was about performance and how you manage performance at Revolut. I recommend everyone and all the entrepreneurs I work with to read it because I think it's really interesting and, and, and really good. Um, but do you want to talk to us a little bit about how you, what's in this playbook and how you manage performance and how much you obsess about it and how you measure it and implement it as, as a process? Because I think it's such a key part of the success of Revolut. Yeah, so uh, basically when I started the Revolut uh, 10 years ago, uh, I uh, didn't believe in management at all. And then I remember a lot of VCs that told me I need to hire experienced managers. And I was, I was always asking him, but what exactly they will do? Just manage people? No, I need to people build products, right? Or, or sell the product. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so with time I learned that actually management is important. And, uh, but I learned it from first principles. And uh, basically I uh, quantify uh, everything, what a person does, a team does, a department does, a company does. So the way it works, it starts with a, with a company goal. So we always define uh, five, six company goals uh, for the year. Uh, and then we cascade these goals uh, to the department and on the team level and individual level. And then we build uh, uh, the whole software around it. It's called uh, uh, Revolut People. Uh, and we're actually selling it now to, uh, to other companies, so revolutpeople.com. And then effectively Revolut People uh, play books everything what we do in terms of goal setting, hiring, uh, scorecards for hiring people, scorecards for performance management. Uh, performance review, how to do performance review. We we'll do performance review every quarter, super important. So we calculate effectively how many strong people we have, how many average people we have, how many people we have below average. So we have system uh, filtering out people who are not performing on a quarterly basis. So it's, so it's a proper machine which uh, uh, with the only goal to produce the best quality people that we have in Revolut. And it's all kind of you know, quantifiable, it's all very process driven, it's all very productized as well. And uh, in Quantum Light, uh, we effectively uh, wrote all the playbooks that we, uh, with time, developed in Revolut. How to manage people, how to hire people, how to do expansion, how to do compliance, uh, how to do risk management, uh, and so on. Because with time, uh, because I, I approach everything from first principles. Since I kind of hired experienced executive, it, it didn't work for me. So I stopped believing in the you know, traditional approach of hiring experienced people. So I developed everything from scratch, just based on my experience. And of course, you know, things uh, didn't work as expected, so I iterated, iterated, iterated until I kind of found uh, the best way to do X, Y, Z. And, the, and the, we uh, kind of documented everything in playbooks. And you think those playbooks could apply to any company and any type of founder? Or do you think you have to be a special type of founder and company for that to, to really work? Yeah, I think uh, it can apply to almost any scale up, right? To, uh, because already if a company is small, 10, 20, 30, up to 50, maybe 100 people, you do not really need to have uh, processes because you know everyone, right? You know who is good, who is not. As soon as you're more than 100 people, then yes, you need to have processes in place. So I think for companies uh, more than 50 to 100 people, it is applicable to every single company. Because reality, as a, as, as a manager or as a founder, you need to know exactly what every single person is doing in the company at this particular point of time. 
Uh, so it's super important. Otherwise, people start working on the wrong things. Otherwise, people uh, start being lazy. They focus uh, on things that are not important to the company. So it's super important to quantify everything and ensuring that uh, people, A, all run in the right direction, and B, they all run very hard. Yeah, the, you mentioned the word first principle quite a few times. Yeah. And you know, it's a word that's being overused yeah. these days, but I think in your case, it really does apply. And I think that's something I really always hugely admired in you is that you, you never took, and I was one of the you know, old VCs that was telling you to hire experienced people. So you know, I was on the wrong end of that. I, I'm, I'm happy to admit it. But you really always took that first principle approach and, and, and did things your own way in a very, you know, and you got to a very successful and also very unique outcome, something that really fits yourself and, and, um, and Revolut. But you also had some inspirations. You know, I think you, know, you mentioned Red Alio's kind of principle or, you know, early on in your journey. Is that still an inspiration of you? Have you added some more? And also more broadly, who do you go to when you are thinking through a problem? You just do it on your own in, in a dark room or do you still ask for some feedback from some specific people who may have gone through the same journey? Yeah, I remember principles. So I read uh, it maybe more than 10 years ago when it was just PDF for 50 pages. I really loved it because it was not, uh, it was very direct. It wasn't PR polished. And then uh, I think five years later, he uh, published a book, yeah. which is now like 400 pages. It's very PR polished. So I, I don't recommend reading it. It's so much worse compared yeah. to initial like principles that he had in PDF. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think uh, like what, what he wrote makes sense, and uh, you know, really kind of not use it, but uh, yeah, sometimes you know, applied it in it, my it, own way. It influenced way. Uh, the way yeah, it, you it, did it. It influenced you know the way I, th I thought, but I think it's more my education because I uh, I kind of you know studied uh, physics, uh, math, so I I learned to model life, right, and then uh, I always kind of you know model. Uh, any aspects of life in a, in, a, in a quantitative way, how the company should operate, how a person should operate, how you need to invest as well with with uh, quantum light. Yeah. yeah. And I, mean, I think I kind of know the answer, but there's something that, that I really wanted to ask you, which was when you started the company, early on you made three very big strategic decisions, which were one is going multi-country, which is definitely, you know, was totally contrary to anything that people were doing in fintech at the time. The, the conventional wisdom was fintech is very localized, there's a lot of regulation, you have to be one country, you can't do multiple countries. The other one was doing multi-product. It was like, even, most people like, oh, you either do consumer or businesses, you decided to do both. And then the third one is you built almost everything in-house, which was very unusual. It was a time where you had to buy everything off the shelf of other SaaS providers, and you never really did that. I mean, you did for some aspects, you know, the processing for a while was, was uh, a third party. But today, I, I'm, most of your stack is built in-house. Yeah, everything is held. Yeah. And so those, and those three th th decisions were very uh, unique, very contrarian, and eventually they turned out to be right. And how, but it's not really something that you can iterate. Like you made them and then you live through them. How did you how did you make those decisions early on? How do you know that that was the right thing to do? Uh, well, first of all, uh, I'm very controlling, right? I, I just hate uh, outside dependencies, which I don't control. And uh, as a result, because I'm very controlling, I early on, you know, brought everything in house. Because uh, in business, if you are dependent on some critical vendor, I mean, it can kill you. Right, and uh, you need to go and then uh, beg a vendor to, I don't know, solve some bugs, or uh, it just it's, it's not worth it, right? So that's that's decision to to bring everything in house, and then going uh, multi-country, multi-product. Uh, I think it's uh, more my nature, right? So I like uh, trying things, and uh, I learned very early on that no matter how smart you are, you just I like, cannot predict what happens. So for me, the best way is just. Uh, try things and then uh, if I feel or if I get some, you know, quantitative feedback that uh, okay, it works, you know, I, I continue going in the same direction. And then if, if I try things and it doesn't work, you know, it's fine. I mean, no, no kind of uh, strings that I should. And, to, and today, yeah. of the, this question of global versus local, because yeah. the argument of it should be a local business because it's locally regulated, 
is, is a valid argument. It is, yeah. But there are also arguments on the other side. And so where do you stand in that band? And what are the advantages that you have by being you know, so, so broad? Yeah, I think you, you, can, uh, uh, you can achieve your goals in uh, being local and then being global as well. It's just being global is much more difficult, right? And then uh, I, I decided for myself that I want to be global because it's, uh, first, it's more meaningful goal more profitable and larger business. Yes, it's much more difficult to build, but why not? Yeah. And so we've talked about all the things that you've done right, a lot of big strategic yeah. decisions that you got right. The most important one, I would say. Are there, are there any other big strategic decisions you got wrong? Well, many, to be honest with you. Uh, like, for example, um, for a long time, I wanted to be as less regulated as possible. It was completely wrong decision. Uh, I think it would be much easier for us to receive all the bank allies that we needed when we were small, with a small number of customers. That's interesting. Because really when you have like 10, 20, 30 million of customers, 50 million of customers now, every single regulator uh, like scrutinizes you a lot for giving the license. If you have only, I don't know, 100,000 customers, for them it's super easy to, to give a license because uh, it's much less riskier for them. So that was, you know, wrong decision. Um, like another wrong decision was uh, the way we've done our expansion as well. Uh, so following this principle of uh, launching things super fast, uh, it actually doesn't work for expansion because uh, when you launch things super fast, we go for like a license, like you know, e-money or money transfer. Um, then your product becomes uh, much less comprehensive compared to banking product. And as a result, it, it, there is not that much product market fit. So we had to redo the whole expansion uh, later, right? So we wasted a lot of resources and uh, time doing expansion uh, in the wrong way. So now the way we do expansion, we always uh, not rush it. So we apply first for banking license and we get banking license and we're launching all the products and maintenance that we have instead of uh, going MVP way, launching some products. So that's another uh, big strategic decision, uh, decision that is wrong. And, and so talking about expansion, the U.S. is, uh, you know, so you launch in the Americas more broadly, Brazil, Mexico, you know, so Colombia is coming and a, and a few others. Uh, any learnings from those? And then how does that apply to the U.S.? And how, how, you know, what is your strategy to crack the U.S. market, which you haven't really cracked yet? Yeah. So U.S. is a, uh, is a credit card driven market. Um, so in uh, finance, uh, debit card uh, makes much less money compared to credit card on the interchange. So interchange is fee that uh, a merchant pays you as an issuer. So the way market is structured in the U.S., uh, everything is credit card driven. There is 2% interchange. So for every $100 transaction, uh, bank is uh, receiving uh, $2 in interchange. And then bank spends majority of these $2 on uh, points or air miles or some benefits. And then if you just launch a debit card, interchange is only, uh, I don't know, half percent in the US. So you cannot really compete with credit card. As a result, if you're not uh, a bank in the US, you cannot issue credit card and then you cannot uh, win the market. So in the US, you need to be credit driven. So in the US, we need to have a bank license to launch a product. Um, yeah. as, a, as a customer of a US bank, I won't name names, but I have to tell you that Revolut is much needed uh, in terms of experience. It's, uh, it's, it's basically where the UK banking system was 10, 15 years ago. So I can't wait for you to really make it there. Um, talking about compliance and uh, risk and compliance, the other week I had some of your team come to present um, and to demo what you've built you know, in-house. So we talked about building everything in-house. And you really built this incredible engine that basically ingests all rules and regulation and can turn it into uh, key risk indicators that you can track in real time, and you can go back to the original, the source of, uh, of, of the risk indicator. And um, so first of all, it's, it's a really impressive tool that, that you built. And also what was interesting is that they were, it was the, the, the team that built it, and that is in charge of compliance, but they were also thinking about selling it to third parties. So similar to Revolut uh, people, the, the, the hiring man the people performance management tool that you are selling, you're also now working on selling your core compliance and, and risk engine. So I'm curious about, so it's a bit of a kind of AWS strategy of, you, know, you build your core product and then you sell them. Is that, the, is that a core part of the future strategy? Do you think that's gonna be a big revenue driver for the company? And is there anything that you can't sell to third party that are, is too proprietary? 
I mean, as, as I said before, I'm just trying things on, you know, hopefully some of them will work. I mean, that's a very simple strategy. So we build something and then we want to try to sell it to third parties. And uh, if third parties love it, you know, we, we continue doing it. So I don't know whether it will work or not in the future, but uh, now we, we just want to try to sell it. Awesome. Well, I think we are, I think we are at time. Um, that was fast. Yeah, that was, that was really quick. Yeah. I don't know if there is a transition. Uh, yeah, I think we're good. All right. Cool. Well, awesome. thanks, Nick. Thank you. It's good to see you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.